So in this video, we're going to talk about a very important concept within digital logic, which is an ALU. Now, ALU stands for Addition and Logic Unit. And if you look at the circuit for an ALU, you, the, the name makes um, a whole lot of sense. We see down here at the very bottom, I've got an adder. And then I've got some logic gates here as well. I've got some AND gates as well as some inversions. And the way that the ALU works is I've got my inputs, at least two inputs. We're, we'll call them A and B, right? A and B. They come in, and then I also have these inputs over here on the side, W and X, that are used to select what operation is going to be performed. And since we have some options here, right, the, the op options that we have in this particular case are um, addition, subtraction, um, and, and then uh, simply passing through A. Um, so W and X are going to be fed into these multiplexers, right, that are going to choose the appropriate combination of input values uh, to get us the that we desire. So in this particular ALU, I mentioned we have four operations. We're operating on two-bit inputs. So I've got two two-bit input values coming in here. I can perform addition, right, if I go through the I0. Um, Part. I can perform subtraction if I go through I1. I AND the values together um, if I go through I2. And then I3 simply passes A through. It doesn't do anything to B. If this looks familiar to you, I, I hope that it does look familiar to you. Um, that's because we've actually already constructed uh, a similar circuit for lab um, 2, I believe. Um, so we've already constructed a very similar type of circuit to this called an ALU. And of course, you are also going to need to construct an ALU for the final lab, lab five. But there's a little bit more to lab five than this. Um, so to, to recall the previous video, you'll remember that we talked about register files. So what a register file allows us to do is store a set of values and then also read those values back out so we can write through the write ports, which we see in green, and we can read through our read ports, which on this uh, diagram are shown in orange and in gray. And so then, in order to create a CPU, we really need two pieces. We need this ALU, and we also need the register file. If we combine these two components together, we get what's called a CPU. Now, a CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. That is at the heart of every computer that you've ever touched. Um, all of those computers will have CPUs in them um, that consist of ALUs and register files. And so what it ends up becoming is something like this, where um, it, this is not a complete diagram by any means, right? That's sort of your job to figure out for the final lab. Um, but what we've got now is an ALU that is accepting inputs from a register file and then passing those outputs back out to a register file. So all of the data that's coming in and all of the data that's coming out is going through this register file. That is a CPU. Now, what's missing here? What do you need to figure out for lab five? Well, all of these control signals, where should the data be written to, right? Should I have write enable high or should it be low? Should I have read enable be high or should it be low, right? Those are all things that need to be determined. Um, in addition, we're not using an ALU that looks quite like this for the lab. We're using a slightly different ALU with, with uh, a few additional operations that this ALU cannot perform. Right? So you'll, you'll actually need to implement what's called an instruction set that has been given to you on the lab. We talked about this in class uh, prior to break. And so here is the instruction set. Think of an instruction set as being all of the available operations that a CPU can perform. So in this case, right, we have a very simple CPU. I think it's going to take in three bits, three bits in, three bits out. And these are all of the potential operations that this CPU can perform. And so that instruction contains everything that the CPU needs in order to do its job. So consider uh, an example operation such as um, shifting left, right? The instruction contains all of the information that I need to perform this shift. So the first three bits are the opcode, right? Those first three bits will be 100. Zero, zero. That will tell me to shift left. The second three bits will be the source. 
So I can go to the register file then. Once I see that I have this opcode, I can go to the register file and say, hey, give me the value at this particular address. So I'm going to put um, the next three bits on the address port, and I'm going to set the read enable bit to be high. That will get me the value that I need to shift to the left. right? And then once I perform that shift, the next three bits, the destination, will tell me where to put the result of that shift left operation. So in that particular case, what do I need to do? I need to set the right address to be those three bits and then set the right enable signal to be high. Right? One thing that you'll need to pay attention to on the lab when working with your CPU is um, in relation to the register file, actually. Notice that for a register file, it's going to take at least one clock cycle to perform a write. It's also going to take at least one clock cycle to perform a read. Why is that important? Well, consider the instructions that you're being asked to perform. If I look at my shift left again as, as an example, I need to read a value out. That's what reg source does, is read a value out of the register file. So I need to read a value out, and then I need to write that value back in after it's been shifted left. So right there, that determines that I'm going to need at least two clock cycles to perform this instruction. One clock cycle to read the value from the register file, and then the next clock cycle to perform the shift and write that value back into the register file. So a lot of these instructions are going to require at least two clock cycles in order to um, complete the, the instruction. Um, so when you're working on this lab, if you haven't figured this part out already, you might consider um, trying to find a way to track which of those clock cycles you are in. Am I on the read phase or am I on the write phase? Or am I on some other phase? It doesn't have to take exactly two clock cycles. If you decide that they need to take three or five clock cycles, then you're certainly welcome to do that as well. Um, this is actually a very important concept called pipelining, which I wish I had more time to talk to you about, uh, but it's kind of outside the scope of this class. So when you go on to take additional courses in digital logic, uh, you'll definitely talk about pipelining, and you'll, you'll hear a lot more about that at that point in time. Uh, but for now, I believe that does it for this section on ALUs. And this is also the final video of the class, so I'd like to take just a quick moment to thank you for watching these videos and for participating in class. Uh, I think it's been a really great semester. And uh, yeah, let's go out there and get it finished up.